Uh, so next up, um, we're going to be jumping directly into a full-blown presentation just on hydrogen, hydrogen market. So uh, Mark Eldridge is going to be giving that uh, for us. Mark is our market director for renewables and leads our group level initiatives in hydrogen and renewables. Uh, so Mark has got his PhD in material science, welding, metallurgy, so he is not uh, a polymer guy, he is a non-polymer guy. Uh, so, so many of us call it non-metallics, let's start calling it non-polymer, right? That's good. <laughs> so with that, I give it to Mark. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, as Neil has eloquently put, I'm a uh, metallurgist by background. Um, Market Eldridge, Market Director for um, Renewables and Hydrogen for the Element Group. Um, I wanted to give you a slightly different perspective this afternoon, really about more of a, a sort of context of a lot of the things we do, because I think context is really important, be it metallics, non-metallics. I started life as a metallurgist with what was British Steel, and then worked with the aerospace industry, GKN Aerospace, for a while on A350-400M programs um, on, obviously, carbon fibre um, composites. And then over the last few years, worked around the gas industry about how do we repurpose gas grids to hydrogen going forward with bays and things like the High for Heat program, H100 in the UK. Um, but this afternoon, I just really wanted to talk about addressing some of those material science challenges that hydrogen presents itself. We've all seen graphs like this. Um, the most important reason for putting it up is, is really time. So when we talk about material science, we talk about testing, <coughs> these graphs basically show we've, we've not got any time to do that. So really what I was going to talk about this afternoon is, is what does smarter testing look like against the backdrop of this. But we know that hydrogen offers a, a, an ability to couple lots of sectors within the whole supply chain. So at one end, we've got renewables on the left-hand side. Um, we potentially use technology for um, producing our hydrogen all the way through to our end uses at the other side. But that presents itself with lots of contexts of, of where we are talking about hydrogen and, and what does the context of your product services sit against that value chain. And it's important that basically context never goes off the agenda because we can't really have one thing without another. We can't create a product without actually having hydrogen to, to put through it. How do we create the hydrogen? How do we create the demand, et cetera, et cetera? So what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon, uh, a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour, really, is, is just to break open this idea of what is a test. So if we talk about um, conventionally, it's about reliability of something especially before it's taken into widespread use. So if we think about hydrogen, a lot of the demonstration projects we're looking at, a lot of the technologies we're looking at, some of which the science is not new, but different context and application, but we're looking to try and develop these things at the same time as back to the first chart, which is we've got no time to do it. And we've basically got to develop, scale, and put in use within that time scale all at the same time. So back to what does testing actually mean within that, and also how do we test better and smarter within that context when we're talking about a hydrogen economy and a transition to hydrogen. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about that context and perspectives, a V model which some of you are familiar with in terms of how do we validate that whole process, um, a little bit about some of our digital and physical services around that because it's really important that we think about digital and physical based testing in order to do things in a smarter way to compress that time scale that it's going to take us to actually get there. And then really some concluding remarks and obviously questions at the end uh, as we go. But I'd like you to just take really from today and this afternoon into the presentations and the conference tomorrow really with that takeaway of what does smarter testing look like within the context of the energy transition about your products and services that you're looking at when it comes to looking at hydrogen. And it's a bit of like the eight blind monks around an elephant. Um, everybody's got a different view of that perspective depending on where you sit, where your products sit. Okay? So it's really important that we, we contextualise when we're talking about hydrogen, where are we? So we need to look at the whole system. So are we at a resource level? Are we at a production level? And that might be blue, it might be green hydrogen, it might be looking at CCUS, it's like where do we get the water from, et cetera, et cetera. 
equally the storage and transportation side of things, and then really end use and utilisation. So an aerospace manufacturer might have a very specific focus in terms of what they're looking at for hydrogen, but equally if we can't basically get that hydrogen to where we need it to be at an airport, um, it's a bit of a hiding to nothing. And if we take this example of, of what does a system product scalability time and cost looks like within the aerospace context. So if we look at global production of hydrogen, we might be somewhere about 75 million tonnes at the moment. We may need to get up to somewhere like 650 million tonnes, depending on which report you read. But a lot of that is grey, so we've basically got to convert that to um, blue by basically capturing that CO2 straight away before we create any more hydrogen going forwards. But then if we look at an airport the size of Paris Orly, if we just take 30% of flights for an airport that sort of size, and we basically say we're going to convert to liquid hydrogen as our fuel, that's about 270 tonnes a day. But if we look at liquefier capacity globally, that's about 350 tonnes a day. So you can start to see the scale of the challenge that we're looking at here. And then we start to get into safety and efficiency levels. Liquefaction, we might be getting at sort of energy losses of about 40%. Okay? So again, we can start to see the challenges around an energy system of just looking at converting one airport. Then if we look at the methodology from, say, electrolysis, and if we look at that in a sort of solar context of where does that energy come from, we're looking at about 40 plus square kilometers of solar panels to create enough electricity in order to create that hydrogen. Then we get into electrolyzer plants and production. So all I'm saying is back to this context of looking at a system and a product level, the two are interchangeable, and we've got to look at the system, we've got to look at products, when especially looking at a transition. And that's really about adding pieces of a puzzle, not necessarily whole pieces of testing. So where is the problem? And really, what smarter testing means for me is how can we support you as a company to basically put different pieces of the jigsaw into whatever your problem is that you're wrestling with, be it a conceptual problem, be it a, a, a systems-based problem, or it's actually physically based on a product that you're wrestling with. And obviously, eloquently, Glyn and, and Barry have gone through some of that key expertise around sort of non-metallics earlier, but it's a case of looking at those pieces of the puzzle to fill those in. And how do we do that? We look at a validation model. So we might start on the left-hand side with well, actually, we're not clear what we want to do. We know hydrogen is going to figure strongly in our energy transition, but where do we start? And that might be really about coming up with a problem statement before we even get to a testing strategy, before we even know what we want to design. Once we've actually know what we want to design, we can then get into what is it you want to test, and then we get into some of more of that core material science of why do you want to do that in the most effective way. But if we simulate that and start to create models around that, that we then go through the V model, one, you can cut down the amount of physical testing you do on one side, and then basically go through an iterative process. And back to the first slide, that takes less time and less cost and allows us to hopefully get to where we need to be in a much more efficient way, which for me is what, largely what smarter testing means. So, I started life as a metallurgist, so I'll start with a metallic pipe and then we'll move on to the non-metallic pipes in a minute. But um, welds, fitting, jointing, coating, seals, but equally in terms of the non-metallic pipes, as we've already talked about, in terms of what are the issues from a, a technical perspective within those. And then if we're talking about blue hydrogen, we mustn't forget the infrastructure that then naturally offshoots that in terms of CO2, carbon capture and storage. And again, we've got to think about the whole system of how that comes together to allow us to get our hydrogen from A to B and also where our products sit within that, that jigsaw puzzle. And then as we've already heard, it's not just about 100% hydrogen, it can be about hydrogen blends. Equally, if we're passing gas through a pipe system at three times the speed based on the, the physical properties of hydrogen, um, we start to have issues around impurities, impurities in the gas. We start to have issues about sound and noise things like metering, jointing, coupling, permeation, etc. All of these things come to the fore. Um, we've also mentioned about cryogenics, about looking at temperatures and pressures, all of which impact basically that context of what we're talking about when it comes to hydrogen within infrastructures around energy. So for a long time, as, as, as Neil mentioned at the beginning, in terms of the opening address, we've had a long experience in terms of the physical side of testing. 
looking at things of, of fracture mechanics and, and ECA, fracture mechanics, engineering critical assessments. Um, but what does that look like within a hydrogen environment? But as we all know, it's not metallics and non-metallics. They all come together as, as one system, essentially. What do the coatings need to look like that basically sit potentially on a metallic pipe? What do the coatings need to look like that maybe sit between a metallic pipe and a composite pipe? Um, all are interesting things when we basically start to look at what are those effects. At the same time, it might be polymers, it might be um, um, carbon fibre composites, but there's a whole range of things. And the aerospace industry is looking at their tanks. What do engines look like? What do compressors look like? What do turbines look like? Again, it's all closely related to an interrelated system. And we know from metallics point of view, things like ductility, fracture, fatigue are really important. Glyn's already talked to about um, um, uh, diffusivity, um, solubility, etc. But again, all of these factors are really key when it comes to what is the impact on hydrogen on the materials that sit within these infrastructures. And we're basically going from looking at testing H2S um, in the oil and gas industry to essentially um, testing, as Barry's already talked about, so bolted compact tensiles, looking at basically testing in hydrogen environments, both metallic and non-metallic, in terms of temperatures and pressures in a vessel, um, and looking at what the effects are when we hold hydrogen for long periods of time in these contexts and what happens. Two, looking at cryogenic temperatures in, in, the, in European labs, we basically test in Milan with liquid helium, um, down to sort of minus 260, but equally we've just um, purchased, as, as Neil said, NTS in the States, that's got capacity up to about 2,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen that we can start to look at around a space facility. So it's really taking the learnings from industry that already operate in terms of cryogenics and, and hydrogen, and how can we apply that to the testing that we need from a material science perspective within that context. Two non-metallic effects, Glyn's already mentioned in terms of looking at thermoplastics, what's the effect of, of, of hydrogen versus when we look at methane. Um, to rapid gas decompression with, with hydrogen. Again, where does that sit in the context of that system in terms of the energy transition? This is an example from, from NTS in the States, but just to give you a feel for um, the scale of this, this is 700 gallons per minute liquid hydrogen, um, liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen type facility, which is looking at fluid tests for um, the space industry but straight away you can start looking at thermal shock effects in terms of what's going on with those energy transitions depending on what your products and services need to be tested against and reverse engineering from the space industry back to what is that context within the energy transition, be it as a, a gas distribution system, be it is it in, uh, a fuel cell, for, or is it for a, a, an aircraft fuel tank or is it some form of the production at the front end, again that whole life cycle of hydrogen. Simon, after me, will talk on um, some of our digital experience within the business. So um, if you can imagine it, we can essentially model it. Um, and there's a whole range of, of physical testing capabilities. We've got somewhere in the region of about 60 engineers in the UK, which is a sizable proportion. <coughs> with plans to grow that to about 120 over the next 12 to 18 months in support of everything else that we do in Element as well. So that can be looking at the production side of things, transport and storage, so things like plume dispersion, and what happens when we get a leak? When does deflagration detonation become a challenge? What are the safety systems that we need to put around that when we know basically hydrogen permeates and leaks? The gas system is a bit of a Swiss cheese. If we put hydrogen through it, it basically leaks even more. What happens to that hydrogen? Where does it go? What's the safety systems we need to put around that? Two, what's a fuel cell with hydrogen? What are the key issues with that? What are the materials challenges within that? Um, and we can start with digital twins of that context, but we can take that digital twin context around a metallics, non-metallics perspective. So here's an example of a, of a fuel cell and really just looking about where the hydrogen goes within the fuel cell and how can we optimize that. And this is some work we've done for, for various manufacturers of how can they optimize their fuel cell in terms of modeling it in this particular way with physics-based models, FMEA, um, computational fluid dynamics, etc. Two, here we are in London. What does a fuel tank look like on a, on a fuel cell bus? There's lots of context in terms of the, the pressures, the, the rigors of that bus rolling up and down in terms of the, the road. Um, again, we can model that and basically the, the client can optimize what their particular situation is. Simon will come on to talk about this in a little bit more, but 
you know, what happens when we put liquid hydrogen in a fuel tank and we get boil off pressures and it has all sorts of challenges in terms of from a safety perspective in terms of that design. But again, if you're looking at gases, if you're looking at cryogenic temperatures in terms of whatever those products and services are in your particular context, these sorts of things are important. One, to define the problem statement, but also how do we go about addressing that and where do we need to focus our attention in terms of physical testing in a much more optimised way to validate models like this in a much more efficient timescale. Two, here we've got an FPSO, which is a floating um, offshore <coughs> platform. And here we were basically looking at where do we get gas leaks, um, not in a hydrogen context, but it's exactly the same parallel, to how can we basically mitigate those in terms of the design and work back from those. And again, when we're looking at a systems-based perspective, back to that, how do we produce hydrogen, where do we use it, all of these things are very relevant. So turbine lifing, so we talk about compressors, the design of compressors going forwards needs to be very different for hydrogen. Likewise, in terms of turbines um, and, and aircraft engines, etc., what's the effect of hydrogen on those materials within those both non-metallics and metallics is all very relevant. Here this time we're actually looking at the systems base. So again, that systems based model in terms of a 1D model can be applied to anything. But here we're looking at what are the individual components in an aircraft engine, then going basically on subsystem modeling and then basically the full engine modeling. And this is looking at air, oil, fuel systems. So when we're looking at multiple materials all being put together, whatever those contexts are and how does that system operate, it's one thing to look at how the material behaves specifically, but then modeling the system of how does that behave when we're basically putting gas into it in whatever that context is, or it might be just how we put it into the system in the first instance. So really, just to sort of start to summarize, what does material tick actually mean? And back to the first slide, when you've got no time, you've got to achieve all of these things in terms of validation, evidence-based cases around how do these materials behave within a new context around, say, hydrogen within the energy transition. And we've got to do all of that at the same time. We've got to create our systems and our, our material models. At the same time, we've got to think about scaling and then basically put these things into place so they can actually achieve what we need to do in terms of a very, very tight net zero time scale. And it's really starting to look at where we are in a physical world, but combining that with a digital world. So we basically start to offer you as an industry materials knowledge and those pieces of the jigsaw as opposed to bespoke testing programs, which is a sort of end point after you've really thought about it. For me, it's really how can we help you think about that to optimize things in a much, much more efficient way. So it's really looking about the whole system. It's really about going through what are the pieces of the puzzle we can help you with at whatever stage that is. And it's really going around that V model to say, right, let's est establish where we are with this and iteratively go around that so you can basically maximize your performance in a much shorter time scale. So thank you for listening. Um, hopefully that's useful again today in, in a slightly different context and, and some of the material science we've been talking about. But please take some of those thoughts and really take them through the conference over the next day or so and really just come back to what does it mean against my, my products, my material, but in the context of that system of how we can optimise that. Thank you very much.